So right now, there are various estimates that say between 200 and 500 million people could be plunged into extreme poverty um, as a result of the um, global um, health pandemic um, that we are living through. I find it curious that so many millions of people could be plunged into, into extreme poverty because what that says is that our, our metrics before was not adequate, right? The fact that people who converged from living on an existence of $1 a day to say $3 a day, um, that that is not adequate uh, in terms of resilience, right? And that people were already precarious and already made vulnerable uh, because of the global architecture and because of what we have counted and not counted uh, when it comes to progress. That the opportunity now is to be able to go back to the drawing board and revisit these metrics that we use um, to say that the world is on a sustainable path. Because clearly, um, the fact that so many people um, were just had no kind of social safety net whatsoever to withstand the shock um, of the, um, not just the, cri the crisis as it pertains to COVID, but also the fallout of the crisis, right? The economic crisis that followed. Um, and so what this means is that we need to go beyond um, what I call the zero um, mentality, right? This idea that the minimum threshold is good enough um, because ultimately that doesn't provide the kind of resilience that communities, particularly the most vulnerable and marginalized communities need um, in order to live a life of dignity and a life that, that, that is able to withstand um, these various shocks that we, that we um, are talking through. The way that we think about policy and talk about policy making um, tends to compartmentalize issues, right? So we think about gender issues as being separate from climate and we think about climate as being separate from health and we think about health as being separate um, from the economy, right? And so I think the invitation that's embedded in this moment is really calling upon policymakers and activists to really think about what does a um, an, an integrated policy landscape look like, right? So how do we, because we, we know that people don't live single issue lives. People embody a multiplicity of experiences um, and the fact that we don't account for that in our discourse means that people will fall through the cracks, right? The fact that we've not made the connection between racial inequality and racial injustice and those that are um, most affected by COVID means that, that, that there is a gap there in the policymaking process, right? So I think one of the ways that we were able to bridge the gap between social justice and international development is really to do that work of excavation. I think the second thing is that we cannot underestimate the importance of representation. Representation matters. And so when it comes to the decision-making process, uh, where, the, where the agenda of the planet is being shaped, we need to ensure that the, that the representatives in those rooms look like the communities um, that we are um, uh, advocating um, on behalf of. And I think the um, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development it really offers us a guideline, uh, a roadmap to be able to ensure um, that all societies are able to rise equally. Um, and, and, and so this is why, you know, the, in, the indivisibility of these goals becomes so incredibly important.